Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. A historic moment this week in our nation's capital as the United States Senate wrapped up the impeachment trial of President Donald Trump with an acquittal vote that was split down party lines with the exception of one vote, the Republican Party, with Senator Mitt Romney. Just a day after he gave his third State of the Union address before Congress, President Donald Trump, who was previously impeached by the House on abuse of power and obstruction of Congress charges in December, was acquitted by the Senate, ending the five-month ordeal rooted in his dealings with Ukraine. South Carolina senators weighed in on the Senate floor before voting against the two articles in a near party line vote, with the exception of Republican Senator Mitt Romney on the abuse of power article. I worry about the future of the presidency after what's happened here. Ladies and gentlemen, you will come to regret this whole process. The House manager said over and over again that the Senate has to allow new witnesses so as to make the Senate trial fair, but they didn't bother with the notion of fairness when they were in charge in the House. President Trump claimed victory and continued that victory lap at the White House, where he gave remarks saying he was exonerated. However, key witnesses and documents remain withheld and could be subpoenaed in the future. Objection. The motion is agreed to. The Senate sitting as a court of impeachment stands adjourned. Sine die. Joining us to discuss the impeachment vote and what happens next is University of South Carolina political science professor Bob Oldendick. Bob, thanks for coming back. Glad to be here. So we last talked, I think, right before when everything was going on with the impeachment in the House. You know, they were still working their way through it. Uh, but now we have seen the Senate acquit the president on two counts of uh, articles of impeachment. And I'm wondering, you know, these past five months that we've been looking at this ongoing saga up in Congress, do you think it was worth it for these congressmen to push forward with something that they know was eventually going to get acquitted? Or was this a higher, was there a higher reason for them doing this other than politics, though some say this is just politics? Well, I think for the Democrats, they really need to believe that it is worth it. Because you know, in terms of the impeachment, I mean, Tom Steyer has been out there for two years talking about impeachment. And if you recall how this process works, Speaker Pelosi resisted for the longest time uh, bringing impeachment. They would need to wait. We need to make, but uh, after the transcript was released, it looked like there was pretty much of this was a, an abuse of power. Um, I think they felt they were in a position where they really had to do something. And this had been such a, you know, such a breach of what we usually think of in terms of presidential actions, that if something wasn't brought in this particular case, then there was, what is it going to take to actually bring impeachment? So it was pretty much something that they felt they had to do. Um, with everybody pretty much knowing from the beginning that this is this was the outcome that we were going to have. And when we um, looked at that first transcript and it was released, uh, we talk, commented that, well, if you thought the president did something wrong and you weren't in his favor, you were going to see that this is an impeachable offense. If you were, again, a Trump supporter, you said, but there's nothing here to see. This is politics as usual. So even though this is kind of a, a foregone conclusion, the, the question, did, was it worth it? I think they had to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think it was rushed through in some respects? I mean, do you think we had the full picture going forward with this impeachment, or could there be any follow-up going forward, say, if John Bolton's book eventually comes out and right. we, we see something that might reignite some, some interest in this? Right. We did not get the full picture, but that's where this whole impeachment process ran up against the 2020 election. Because, you know, we had just had Iowa this week, or we kind of had Iowa this week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if, it if we would have waited for, you know, Bolton didn't want to testify, he was going to wait to see the court case, and whether he would be forced to testify, who knows how lo that long that would have taken, and then we would have this whole process drug out. And by the time, let's say, it took till April or May, the people would have said, you know, the election's in five or six months. Let's, you know, what, let's have a true referendum. We get to choose this again. Uh, so the, it really, again, was not a full picture, but the, the reason for that is really the election calendar. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that, um, you know, when we look at the 2020 election, too, we, you know, we saw senators who were on the campaign trail having to go and, and stay up in the, in the Senate while this whole hearing was going on. Do we think that we're going to see um, you know, big ramifications from that? I know we had Iowa during the whole process, too, and Senator Sanders, at least, was, you know, with last we checked, was somewhat tied with... Uh, Pete Buttigieg up there, so it doesn't seem like it nipped him too much, but um, I guess overall it didn't seem like it took too much away from the campaign trail for those senators that were involved in this. I really don't think it hurt those senators much uh, because with social media, they were able to get back on, on Sundays and campaign as much as they could. They had surrogates out there, so it wasn't like they just had to totally suspend their campaign. They, the, people, the people that they had in the field 
really looks like they did a pretty good job in terms of keeping up interest and getting the people out to the caucuses that were going to support those candidates. And just kind of sticking with 2020, do you think that's going to be something that they're going to want to keep bringing up on the campaign trail, even though they, you know, it wasn't acquittal, or do you think that's going to be something they maybe want to shy away from in order to protect some of these down ballot candidates, like you know Joe Cunningham in South Carolina, for example, who's in that that swing district in the first? I think the Democrats will not play up impeachment. I think that. Uh, this is one of those things, well, let's kind of focus on other issues. Let's go, we, we know what the, what the outcome is. Uh, the president was acquitted. Uh, now let's, really, let's kind of you know, flip the switch on impeachment and really get into campaign 2020. Mm -hmm. And I did talk with members of our congressional delegation on this show. Um, Democrats say their impeachment vote uh, in the future will be reflected positively, uh, positively, even though there might be some short-term hurt. Uh, Republicans saying that this was a sham, that uh, it will cost them the ballot box, uh, and that we've since weaponized the impeachment tool for Congress. Do you think that that's the case? Do you think that, you know, is, is, it, say, is it fair to say that this was politically driven? I mean, like we were talking, uh, you know, nothing really came of the Mueller report for Democrats to use as an impeachment tool, but then all of a sudden this, this whistleblower report came out saying that the president, you know, withheld money from an ally, the U Ukraine basically saying, uh, until I get some information on a political rival, we won't give this money. That money was released right before the whistleblower report came out. Uh, so people say that oh, didn't matter. But uh, is it safe to is it is it fair to call this a political, politically driven event when we have some of this documented evidence essentially? Yes, it, it was a politically driven event, and that's what we need to, to recognize about impeachment and the way it's kind of written in the Constitution. It's not meant to be a trial. It really is. Uh, left up to the House to impeach and the Senate to do the trial and either remove or to acquit because uh, the founders set it up as a political process. And so we have this definition in the, in the Constitution you know, for bribery, treason, or high crimes and misdemeanors where high crimes or misdemeanors are never really defined. And so uh, ultimately it was kind of built in as a political process. And that will, that's what we've seen in, in this particular instance. Mm -hmm. So at this point, you know, the president's claiming exoneration. Does that mean that he can, again, do something like this and kind of govern with impunity and not have to worry about being held accountable? If, if some people thought that he was actually, you know, uh, you know, abusing his powers, now he can, he can do essentially the same thing again, ask a foreign power to investigate his rivals, whoever my Democrat nominee might be? Well, we, we have the evidence based on this particular case that the, it seems like the, the president is able to kind of push the envelope and do some things that, at least on one party thinks is just an abuse of power, and the other say, well, this is okay. Remember during the 2016 campaign, the president made the claim, you know, I could shoot a, you know, somebody on Fifth Avenue and I'd still get, you know, they'd still love me. And that was true of the electorate, certainly, but now it seems to be kind of also true in the, in the Senate, at least the Senate Republicans. I'll uh, say, you know, we, the, the base seems to really approve of this person that there's, a, you know, they looked at the State of the Union address and the things he highlighted in terms of the economy and the new trade deals, all the, the po positive things that people can, can point to. And because of that, uh, I think certainly within the Senate, it gives him some leeway to do some things that we haven't seen in, in previous uh, presidency. Mm -hmm. And he is enjoying a high approval rating right now, the highest of his presidency at 49%, according to Gallup. Um, so he does kind of, is taking that victory lap right now. But we've seen bumps in the past uh, we saw that with, with President Clinton when he was acquitted as well. He got a huge boost of up to the 70 percent, I think, uh, in February 19, 1999. So I'm wondering, does this carry him in some respects to November? Or is this, I mean, are we going to be worlds away from where we are right now come, come November, come this, the big general election push this summer and on into November? Well, there's going to be other events that happen between now and then which makes it difficult to predict. But I'd say right now, if you look at what's happened in the trajectory, as you mentioned, uh, the Gallup poll released this week shows you know, the highest approval level. And he really has some momentum coming out of this. And again, you can see the foreshadowing of what the campaign's going to be in terms of uh, the State of the Union address. And it's going to highlight the economy. It's going to make appeals to uh, the Latino vote, to the African-American vote, uh, try to show that what he's done for his various groups that he's had problems uh, gaining support from in the past. And so right now, as we sit here, uh, the, you know, President Trump and the Republicans, are their, their trajectory is going in the positive direction and also aided by the fact that Iowa and the caucuses were just you know, such a disaster for, for the Democrats. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, if, you know, 
that trend line keeps going that direction, then it, it looks like as we sit here, you know, <clears throat> nine months away from the election, that it looks you know be pretty difficult to beat. When we look at the historic perspective of this impeachment, how do you think this is going to chalk up? Obviously, one of the first things that's ever going to be said about the president, you know, when his obituary will be, he was impeached. You know, the same thing with President uh, President Clinton. Uh, I'm just wondering, how do you think history will judge this uh, this moment in in our nation's history? Well, it'll certainly be in there, but it won't be the lead paragraph. Mm -hmm. uh, it, again, this is this is a rare event, and it was you know, meant to be. Uh, that way, because we don't want to, we don't want to try to weaponize impeachment. We don't want uh, every time a new president like to say, "Well, we, you know, we look at, pick up some event and say, well, this is impeachable." So, uh, you know, as history writes, you know, the, the, about Donald Trump, it'll be that he's he's very different in terms of the way he campaigned, the way he got elected, uh, the fact that he di dealt differently with foreign policy and tried to expand executive power, mm -hmm. some of the things that he's done with environmental regulations, and also um, how he really has changed the, the federal court system, you know, the, the, having appointed uh, two Supreme Court justices and a lot of, of circuit and district court judges. Uh, I think that you know, that'll be you know, toward the top of, in terms of the lasting effect that his presidency will have. Do you think with this trial, with, with him being acquitted on these charges, that you know, the, the executive branch has gotten stronger now, like going forward, presidents have more leeway again because he's been able to do what he's done and, and you know, not have much uh, you know, effect from it? Right. As we look at the whole concept of separation of powers and say, where's the balance of power shifted? See, certainly right now it's shift uh, with Donald Trump as president it's certainly shifted in the direction of the executive branch partly because of the way he's acted but also because uh, Congress has, has been complicit you know the Senate with Mitch McConnell's leadership has not been willing to really be c confrontational and al allow a lot of these things to go on we look at you know, a couple weeks ago uh, they revisited the War Powers Act, and Congress is going to try to you know, make some changes to the War Powers Act, so they kind of try to limit that. Like, I think the, particularly the House of Representatives recognizes that the balance is shifting. and they're going to try to uh, claw back some of that power, but uh, it's going to be in pretty much of an uphill climb, at least until after the November elections. And with about two minutes left, were you surprised to see Mitt Romney vote the way he did on the abuse of power and breaking with his party and voting against his party's president? Uh, I know he, it sounded like it really weighed on him. He did say the president's guilty of appalling abuse of public trust by asking a foreign power to investigate his rival and withhold money from that power, an ally. Uh, was that surprising to you to, to hear those words and see that action? No, that wasn't so much of a surprise. If, if we'd have been talking about this a, a week ago before, and before the vote about you know, whether to have witnesses, we had thought that there may be four or five senators on, on the Republican side that were at least willing to consider witnesses, you know, Susan Collins, Cory Gardner, the people that are looked like they'll be in tight races in November. And so uh, when it finally came down to people saw how the, how the politics was going to play out, that this was going to be an acquittal, then the push to do it along straight party lines. And uh, Romney's speech, I think, w was a matter of conscience, and I think it, he, re he recognizes that this is going to be a, a difficult political decision for him, but it looked very heartfelt in terms of this is a matter of conscience for me. And just last question with less than a minute. Do you think we're more divided as a country now as a result of this, this trial having taken place? I know the polls are always pretty divided on whether he should be acquitted or not the president, but how do you see us going forward in terms of where we are as a country? I'd say today polarization at its highest level since it's been since after the Civil War. That when you look at the president's approval rating, we got 49 in favor, 51 opposed. Uh, just about you know the, the total votes for the Senate, the House of Representatives, we can't get closer to a 50-50 divided country than we are today. Sad to hear, Bob. Thanks for joining us. Last week, Seventh Congressional District Congressman Tom Rice joined us to discuss his vision for his district. Tonight, two more join us. Up first, House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn. I spoke with Congressman Clyburn in his Capitol office on impeachment day, December 18th, 2019, about the president, the U.S.-Mexico trade agreement, and more. I led off by asking him about impeachment. From day one, all the way back to the campaign, I did not think that um, Donald Trump acquitted himself well during the campaign. Uh, I don't know why anybody is surprised at his behavior, though I did think that once elected, he would at least elevate 
uh, himself uh, up to the office. Instead, he seemed to be trying to draw, drag the presidency down t to his level. That's never been the case in this country, at least with my experiences. Um, and as things went on, he just seemed to be seeing how far the country would let him go. Uh, and so I reached the conclusion a long time ago that he was not fit to be president. Uh, now, being unfit to be president is something totally different from being impeachable. But I think that uh, it was clear to me you know, when he started making all these admissions as if he was inoculating himself. And that's exactly how I interpret it. Uh, and I came to the conclusion that he needed to be impeached. And I understand why there are only two articles, though I advocated for a third. And I think he qualifies for a dozen. So it's nothing. And it, one thing is a lot of stuff. When we look at 2020, when we look at people in swing districts like Representative Cunningham, do you worry how this vote will affect them getting reelected? I'm concerned. I wouldn't call it a worry, but I am concerned uh, that um, there may be voters who will punish him uh, for voting the way he votes. Though I would hope that voters would be more discernible than that. You can't agree with a guy all the time on everything. Do you think that this vote will be a linchpin or a, a major, I guess, I guess, issue with, with the voters going forward that's going to be hammering? I mean, we already hear from the NRCC and we hear from other groups talking about how this is going to be a big vote that they're going to target folks for. Is okay. that a concern too, or is that something you think will age better than, than the current situation? Um, I suspect the aging process to a vote like this will run far beyond a person's presence in office. So there are a lot of people who may suffer from this vote and find out five or six years later, maybe 10 years later, that it was, in fact, the right vote. Uh, I don't see how anybody can look at this information and uh, not see that this president violated some laws, not just one or two. Uh, he's demonstrated his lack of fitness to hold the office. It's clear. Uh, you may choose to ignore it, uh, and I, I'm amazed at how many people uh, excuse bad behavior because you, you may be doing something you like. And I'm afraid that in most instances, there's something that people like about this guy are not that good. What do you, what do you see UMSA doing for South Carolina? Is it just providing a stable trade policy for businesses and in the poor and other economies, industries in South Carolina to say, hey, we, we have something going on here. We know we, we can rely on this trade policy. Well, I think uh, South Carolina, this is a much better bill than NAFTA. Uh, I did not vote for NAFTA. I didn't like NAFTA. And I was vindicated. Um, and after for all intents and purposes failed. And so this is a way of getting it back on the right foot. Um, we had projects. Um, but um, South Carolina didn't benefit much from NAFTA. Uh, we just saw that spending bill get passed the other day. I want to get your thoughts on what that means for South Carolina. There's a lot in there for South Carolina. Yeah. Um, how that kind of is different than in years past from what we've seen coming out of Congress. Well, it means a whole lot for South Carolina. Um, I've worked very hard trying to make sure that the needs of my constituents uh, or, or, or met. I have been saying for a while now that the greatness of America needs to be made accessible and affordable for all. Uh, and I think that um, a lot of what we did with this bill will help get us there. Uh, in South Carolina, we had this significant expansion 
in your late Grand Eastern Water Agency. We've had a significant expansion in community health centers. We've got um, a significant uh, investment uh, taking place in HBCUs, historical black colleges and universities. There's just a lot going on in this legislation that I think is very helpful to South Carolina. Republican Jeff Duncan has represented the 3rd District of South Carolina since 2011. We were in Washington a few weeks ago and sat down with the congressman. We discussed the growing budget deficit as well as a growing nuclear waste problem in South Carolina and across the country. I let off with asking him how he thinks the impeachment trial will affect Democrats up and down the ballot this year. I think both. I think, um, you know, Americans have a great sense of fairness and they realize the president was not treated fairly in this process. They realize that it was political and I believe this will help the president uh, in a lot of areas that uh, may have been marginal. Uh, I think it will help the House uh, uh, candidates that are running for the House. I think it will help the Republicans take back the House. I think this is going to hurt the Democrats. It, it hurt the Republicans when we impeached uh, Bill Clinton in the 90s, and I think the history is going to play out the same way. How do you, it's kind of speaking of history, how do you see this vote aging when we look at 10 years from now, 20, 20 years from now? What do you think the big takeaway will be in the history books when we look back at this vote? I think when people look back at this vote, they're going to see that the President of the United States was not treated fairly. This was uh, definitely politically driven. If you take it holistically and look at the comments of Al Green and others throughout the, the whole two and a half years here, and I think posterity will look at the, the complete history, you'll realize this was politically motivated. They didn't like the President. They didn't like the fact that Trump uh, beat uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, they, they've tried to to tarnish it with a Russia inclusion hoax. They uh, have tried to tarnish his presidency all along. Um, even before the um, July 25th call with Ukraine, 71% of the Democrats on the Judiciary Committee were in favor of impeaching the president. They would have voted on articles of impeachment in the Judiciary Committee even before Ukraine. This wasn't about Ukraine. This was about Donald Trump and their hatred for him. Uh, you don't impeach a president because you dislike him or because you dislike his policies, but that's exactly what we saw, and I think that's how posterity will see this. Switching to this past year besides impeachment, um, what do you look to as highlights from this past year legislatively that you can take back to the district, back to South Carolina and say, hey, you know, we got some big things done up here in D.C.? Yeah, so we get over 50 percent of our um, electricity generation produced by nuclear power. And if you really look at nuclear power generation, we have 121 communities across the country in 39 states uh, that have uh, non-defense or commercially generated waste sitting on site. Uh, we have a long-term repository that was developed through a lot of geology and Congress voted and it is the law of the land to open up Yucca Mountain. And what we're trying to do is, is move forward uh, making that a permanent repository and getting it cranked back up so that that waste can get off of the shores of Lake Kiowee or the Catawba River or, or the Broad River and actually store it in a long-term repository. Um, there's over 6,000 metric tons of commercial waste in South Carolina, I believe. Now, there's more than that if you add in the Savannah River site uh, defense waste that's sitting there. Uh, we have a, a national solution, a national problem, that is Yucca Mountain. So working hard to get that waste out of South Carolina, we have uh, seven reactors in the state. Um, you know, whether that's Catawba, whether that's Summer, whether that's uh, Kiowee. Um, so, you know, we've been working very hard with uh, John Shemkus of Illinois and, and even some other uh, Democrat uh, colleagues on the committee to move what we call the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act that uh, will actually get it moving back in the right direction. Think about this. Um, South Carolina ratepayers, not taxpayers, but people that buy electricity, the ratepayers in South Carolina, have paid over $3 billion in fees mm -hmm. uh, for the construction operation of Yucca Mountain. They've got nothing for their money because it's not open, it's just sitting there. In addition, taxpayers have uh, kicked in a lot of e extra money uh, on top of that just because of the way the law is written. So there's been a lot of money spent for naught, and we need to get that back. Like I said before, it's a national solution to a national problem. Mm -hmm. The USMCA vote is today. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to get your thoughts on that vote and how it will affect South Carolina and your district. Well, this is the modernization of NAFTA, and uh, NAFTA has been out there for 30 years almost, and uh, it's time to um, to revisit that. I applauded the president when he did that. This was a great deal negotiated with Canada and Mexico. I think the United States benefits. I think South Carolina benefited. If you just think about um, the, the manufacturing origin and how it helps the agricultural community, 6,000 jobs are somewhat associated to the ag trade um, area in South Carolina. 
That's just one area, automotive manufacturing. Um, every business I talk to in South Carolina is very, very pleased with how the USMCA uh, has been played out, and they're ready to see it implemented. It takes a vote in Congress, and I'm ready to cast that vote uh, in an affirmative manner today. Are, are, we, are we talking about the debt? Are we talking about the deficit enough when we look at those numbers right now? Uh, we haven't been. I, I don't. I don't think we've talked in Congress about spending and borrowing since probably uh, one of the shutdowns a couple of years ago. And uh, that's one thing I would, if I had a chance to sit down with President Trump and talk about concerns I have, it would be the spending and the borrowing. We have got to rein in our, our spending trajectory and uh, quit borrowing money um, because one day someone's going to have to pay that debt back. And I'm afraid it's going to be our children, our grandchildren are going to have to work harder, have more taxes taken out of their, their paycheck to pay uh, the debt that's being created today that they don't get any benefit of. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wish Congress would spend a little more effort and the president would talk a little bit more about our spending addiction and our debt. For more South Carolina political news, including the upcoming presidential primaries, visit our website at sctv.org backslash TWISC. Also, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a political podcast that can be found on your podcast app on any mobile device. Each week, I recap the weekly political news with the reporters who cover it. From the Kennedy Greenhouse Studio on the campus of the University of South Carolina, I'm Gavin Jackson.